let trouble come your way Make you no fear When trouble come your way Make you no fear oh. Make you no fear Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome back to BOF Live. I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's discussion on how e-commerce and SMEs are transforming Africa's fashion industries. The inspiration for this conversation was a report published by Anansi entitled Unleashing the Commercial Potential of African Creatives Through Digital Technology. And it was created in partnership with MasterCard, Botho Emerging Markets Group, and the African Development Bank's Fashionomics. The report outlines how entrepreneurial ventures are transforming the African business landscape and investigates technology's role in accelerating industry transformation and influencing consumer behavior. And I'm delighted to have my esteemed panelists with me today. Uh, firstly, Samuel Mensah, the founder of Anansi and the driving force behind the report. Samuel, thank you for joining us from Johannesburg. Pleasure to be here. Um, secondly, uh, Aparupa Chakravati, the a director at both the Emerging Markets Group, who played a critical role in the creation of the report. Thank you, Aparupa. I believe you're joining from Nairobi. I am indeed. Thank you for being with us. And I'm delighted to also welcome Mercy Mutua, the head of access to finance at the MasterCard Foundation. Thank you for joining us, Mercy. Thanks, Robin. A pleasure to be here. Where are you this afternoon? I'm also joining from Nairobi. Lovely. Um, some of the topics today that we'll be covering include how the rise of ride sharing and delivery apps are mitigating the challenges of last mile delivery in key markets and developing logistics networks in the process. We're going to discuss how entrepreneurs are increasingly leveraging the exponential growth of digital connectivity and evolving consumer behavior to drive business growth through social commerce. And finally, we'll discuss the potential of the African continental free trade area to increase synergies and in productivity, lower barriers to trade and movement of skilled employees, and really tra help transform the creative, uh, creative industries in Africa's productivity. Just quickly before we begin, some housekeeping. The chat box is open. Please do introduce yourselves and let us know where you're joining from. Likewise, do drop questions into the Q&A box and we'll do our best to answer all questions that are relevant to the wider community um, if, if we have time to. Um, and finally, I'd like to welcome our audience on YouTube too. too. So with that said, let's begin. Um, in unleashing the commercial potential of African creatives through digital technology, the report, you know, state really focuses on three core recommendations made to which will help accelerate the industry's evolution. The first is to provide adequate funding to creative entrepreneurs. The second is to create opportunities for skills development. And the third is really ensuring that there is an e-commerce focus to ease trade between countries. But before we dive into those areas, Sam, I think it would be fantastic if I could turn to you and really with in keeping the survey in mind that was one of the underpinning elements of the report, how has existing market activity and entrepreneurial ventures helped to transform the market landscape in Africa to date? Great. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, uh, Robin. So the, there are a number of things that are kind of all coming together at the right time. Uh, we are seeing uh, the uh, increase in broadband connectivity rates and higher internet speeds uh, across the continents. There have been several uh, undersea cables that have landed all along the coast um, in the last, you know, five to ten years. So access to um, connectivity has improved significantly. At the same time, uh, you're seeing the prices of smartphones. Um, and connected devices coming down. Um, and additionally, you're also seeing a trend towards <clears throat> more increased use of digital payments, um, increased use of mobile payments. Um, you are also finding uh, fintechs that are sprinkling up, that are solving some of the payment problems uh, around, uh, around the continent. And then there are also innovations, uh, innovations around cash on delivery, but for, <clears throat> but for e-commerce transactions. So you'll all remember when mobile phones were launched initially, uh, you had to only, they were only available on contract and pay as you go was an innovation, uh, particularly in Africa that led to a significant uptake in, um, in, 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 um, 
in access to uh, and the use of the mobile phone. Uh, and the same is happening with, with e-commerce where uh, entrepreneurs and enterprises are innovating uh, to try and solve some of the challenges uh, for example, because of the low penetration of credit cards, looking for other ways in which consumers can pay for goods. Um, and then also, you know, cloud services are coming down. Um, the likes of Google and Amazon uh, all offer those services. Uh, and so it's much, much easier now for entrepreneurs to start businesses because the cost of starting a business has, has come down so significantly in the last 10 years um, as a result. Uh, and, and I think there's also a growing belief uh, in amongst African entrepreneurs, and that's also sparing entrepreneurial activity. Uh, $6.5 billion in venture capital uh, was invested into, um, into Africa last year. Uh, admittedly, most of those would be in tech or tech-enabled businesses. Almost 80% of those were in tech or tech-enabled businesses. Um, so there's also money that's coming into the company, into the, onto the continent that's looking for deals, uh, but it's very, very focused, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> it's, <clears throat> it's very focused on, um, on technology and, um, and tech enabled, enabled businesses. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, it's winter here in Johannesburg, sorry. <laughs> uh, so, the uh, and and also another very interesting point about the capital that's coming into Africa uh, for VC purposes specifically is that almost eighty percent again seventy seven percent of it is is foreign capital. So what this means is that um, the kind of businesses that are able to attract this capital have to be in tech or in tech and noble businesses, um, and then also VCs because the funds that are being invested are primarily in dollars. VCs are looking for returns, for dollar returns, because they're investing in dollars. And as a result, um, they are, there's a, a, a bias towards companies that are earning foreign exchange. I mean, uh, a number of uh, inflation has been quite high recently uh, across all emerging markets and around the world. Uh, and as a result of that, a lot of emerging market currencies have devalued against the dollar. So if you have, if you're an entrepreneur and you've raised money in dollars and your investor is expecting an, a dollar return uh, and your currency, your local currency is devaluing, uh, then you have to sell a lot more uh, in your local currency to be able to pay the investor back. And so that all leads to a level of exclusion uh, for businesses that are more local focused, that are generating revenues in local currency and that are not particularly uh, the, primarily driven by tech, which is what a lot of creative uh, companies fall under. But there is certainly, as a general trend, uh, an increased drive in the launch of entrepreneurial ventures uh, and entrepreneurial ventures, particularly around digital technologies on, on the continent. Thank you, Samuel. Um, Aparupa, to turn to you now, um, in the context of youth unemployment across the African continent, the creative industries and their cultural connection to younger Africans seem to play quite a critical or have a critical an opportunity to play a critical role. Can you tell me a little bit about why the sector is important and especially so for young entrepreneurs and creative professionals? So... First of all, big picture, the fashion, the fashion industry globally is an enormous pie. Um, in 2020, the global luxury fashion apparel market was valued at something like $70 billion, and that's projected to increase to almost $300 billion by 2030. And if you look at the secondhand and resale fashion apparel market, which is even bigger, in 2022, it was close to $200 billion and is expected to increase to over 350 billion dollars in the next in the next few years uh, up until 2027 and the fashion industry is just one industry in the broader creative economy which is even bigger it's an over 2 trillion dollar market of which africa currently only has a 1% share so clearly there's a ton of room to grow and i think i mean just from that very small snapshot the economic um, importance of the creative economy cannot be understated by any means, right? Um, and then as for the as for the opportunity for young people in and of itself, I think 
I think our our report, if you look at if you look at the, the the core survey that underpins our report, the demographic makeup of the of our respondents kind of speaks speaks to this, right? In and of itself. So out of 329 people we surveyed across 46 African countries, 53% were under the age of 35. They're young people. And this is from 16 to 35. They're really young people. And even though uh, a lot of their businesses, they were selling various types of products, whether it's accessories, home decor, um, uh, art, and what have you, the majority, I think over 60%, if I'm not mistaken, were selling clothing and apparel, either exclusively or in conjunction with other products. So you can already start to see now where some of these things are veering towards in terms of, in terms of both the demographic and also what they're interested in actually sort of like selling as, as part of their micro businesses. And then speaking of micro businesses, currently the fashion industry um, specifically, but also other creative and uh, cultural industries in the continent are dominated by micros and small and medium enterprises, right? So something like 90% of African fashion businesses are MSMEs. And so if we really want to unlock the full potential of this industry and the, the sector more broadly, and not just for young people, but really across the board, we need to start to create the right conditions to get these MSMEs to grow and scale. And that was really sort of like that, that really kind of speaks to the heart of what this publication is meant to be about. Mercy, I'm going to come to you in a minute. I'm sorry. Thank you for your patience. But just one, one more question for Aparupa and Sam. Um, in the report, you write that Senegal may not be known for mass apparel production, but it's rapidly establishing itself as one of the world's design capitals, thanks to its strong culture of hand weaving, wide supply of handcraft exp ex experts and raw materials and tailors and an amazing culture that surrounds it. You know, thinking about those SMEs that dominate that dominate the 90% of the industry, what are the barriers that exist currently? And Samuel, you've just already raised that VC funds will, will favor tech-driven businesses and businesses that operate in dollars, et cetera, et cetera. But with the exception of that, and potentially with the exception of finance, which I'm going to come to speak to Mercy about in, in just one second, what do you think are the, are the sort of top line, headline barriers that are that are going to make it more challenging for these businesses to grow? Sam, perhaps you want so, to go first. Oh, no. Yeah, <clears throat> Sam, you go first. Yeah, so um, one of the, there are a number of challenges. Um, we'll park access to finance in a, while, in a minute. Um, the, um, the, the challenges around e-commerce particularly revolve uh, around the issues like, like payments. Uh, payments are still incredibly difficult. A lot of countries on the African continent have exchange controls. Uh, it makes uh, trading across barriers and uh, moving money, pay making payments and receiving payments across barriers quite challenging. Uh, and so that, 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 that is in itself is a challenge. There's also a challenge around uh, when it comes to um, e-commerce around skills. Um, the understanding of how to use e-commerce platforms, how to set up, um, how to set up themselves on an e-commerce platform, uh, how to manage one, um, how to basically just run, uh, you know, the e-commerce, whether it's Shopify, Anansi, or some other platform. Uh, and we find that a lot of the, the entrepreneurs don't have the skills. Uh, the other challenge is really around scaling um, and what happens when they are able to secure large orders and the, uh, the opportunities that are available to trade with bigger buyers, off-takers internationally, mm -hmm. securing those large orders, and then being able to actually fulfill those orders you know, that has a working capital element, of course. And then there's also the logistics of having the products move from, say, Senegal or Accra or Johannesburg uh, to wherever they may be going um, in the world. Then the other challenge around um, e-commerce has to do with policy. And the modernization of policies, especially uh, customs policies, to accommodate um, e-commerce on the African continent. So for example, um, the e-commerce regimes in practically every African country does not yet allow for e-commerce returns. So uh, if you are in, 
an African country and you have a customer in another country and they try to return a product to you, the customs authority in practically every African country treats it as if it's a new product coming in. Um, and because of course these systems were designed very long ago before the advent of, uh, of e-commerce. So there's some of these policy tweaks and some of them are quite easy. We'll talk about AFCTA later. Um, some of these policy tweaks that uh, will make markets a lot more attractive for e-commerce and make it so much easier for some of these really talented, creatively talented um, designers and artisans to be able to trade more effectively, especially internationally. Aparupa, we've heard skills. We're going to talk finance in a moment, policy. What, what else is standing in the way? So... I think the important thing to kind of recognize is that insofar as social media and e-commerce together have really helped small businesses sort of expand their reach in a, and visibility in a lot of ways, the, pro the, prolifer the proliferation of these kinds of digital enablers in and of themselves is not always enough, right? So 65% of our survey respondents were already selling online, which is huge. It's the vast majority. But when we dug into the numbers, we realized that the bulk of their revenue was still coming from offline channels. And then those who weren't selling online cited a number of like barriers to entry and a, and a bunch of these um, uh, Sam's already alluded to, right? Things like maybe not understand and not understanding how to like navigate a platform, lacking the necessary skills. Um, it's expensive to set up sometimes, like to, to set up that online business, etc. And so, I, I think e-commerce is an incredibly valuable opportunity here, but there's a lot of environmental things that need to be addressed. I won't I won't sort of regurgitate what Sam has already mentioned, but I think the one thing that I would like to add is there are also sort of socio-cultural factors around this that also need to kind of be um, taken into consideration. And I think one of these, for example, is around trust. Trust, mindset, and perception. Anecdotally, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. Um, last week, I was, at the, I was at the African Union Private Sector Forum that was held in Nairobi. And one of the speakers, um, and, and the focus of this particular forum was the AFCFTA. So that was uh, uh, the crux of the discussions. And one of the speakers, when he sort of was making his own opening remarks, uh, there must have been maybe 100, 200 people in the room from across the continent. It was pretty, it was a really incredible um, uh, forum. He asked, he asked us, he was just like, of those of you in the room, who would be comfortable and confident to order a product from anywhere else in the continent and bring it, ship it to you today? And like two people raise their hands. Wow. Literally two people raise their hands. Yeah. Um, in a room of like 100, 200 people. And that was like revelatory, right? When we've all come together to talk about AFC, FDA, how are we going to trade within the content and how's the private sector going to engage in this framework? And I think a big part of that speaks to obviously the hard stuff, the so-called hard stuff. So payments, policies, logistics, et cetera. But also it speaks to perception, right? And how do we start to like build out these African bands, brands? How do we sort of like encourage people to buy African products and sort of really sort of bolster the visibility and the, the branding around these things? I think that's also quite important to do in tandem. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mercy, um, I'd love to get your take from an access to finance perspective. And, you know, we've heard a little bit about cross-border payments and, and access to markets, but Firstly, I'd like to hear what the foundation does to enable access to finance for entrepreneurs and, and how it's sort of mapping its solutions to the needs of that community. But I'd also love to hear your any additional thoughts you have on the movement of payments and cross-border issues, et cetera. Yeah, thanks, Robin. So um, at the foundation, we are actively engaging with uh, different partners, both you know private sector partners, um, NGOs, you know, a wide range of partners to really tackle this financial inclusion um, issue, which is one of our charitable mandates, you know, as a foundation. And if particularly I narrow down to access to finance, because of course there are the financial and non-financial barriers that, uh, as you've heard from both Sam and um, um, <laughs> I always forget how to call it. <laughs> yes, but when you talk about access to finance, really the, the key elements that we need to look at are the lending rates, the tenor and the collateral. And especially more so when you're talking about these smaller entrepreneurs, the MSMEs. And if I look at the, uh, to speak about the lending rates in Africa, they are high. We have rates as high as in the hundreds when you look at especially digital financial providers that are charging um, a rate per day, really. Wow. 
Yes, and, and these rates are really high and they're not tenable and not sustainable for any business model. So how do you start to bring down these rates? Then when you look at the tenor, you know, we really don't have much access, especially these MSMEs to longer term tenor, and they really need do need patient capital. So you find they get very short term capital that they have to keep recycling and become very onerous to always access it. And the last bit is the collateral, really. A, a lot of the financial institutions and more so the more established and traditional ones like the banks and the MFIs, MFIs will always ask for the collateral. Now, when you look at this particular sector, what's the main collateral really? It's the intellectual property. And what is intellectual property? It's so intangible. How do you price it? How do you value it? How do you collateralize it? It's, it's difficult. Hence, this is the, it, it becomes a very vicious cycle. This is the only asset that they entrepreneurs have that they can offer to the financial institutions, but the financial institutions do not know how to, to manage it as a collateral, hence really do not accept it as a collateral. And, and then, so it just becomes a vicious cycle in terms of really how these uh, MSMEs can access capital. We've seen good strides over the years, you know, both with the traditional um, financial institutions and the more innovative institutions, really. And even, even the traditional ones like the banks are starting to embrace uh, innovative mechanisms, really, of de de delivering finance to uh, businesses perhaps that are not as structured as they want them to be. And, and this is very key for us, really, when we're looking for a partner. What's the innovation angle here? And the lenses with which we... Um, we program really is around inclusivity, it's around sustainability, it's about equitability, and it's around resilience. You know, those are the lenses we wear when we're partnering with any institution. So being aware of some of these um, risk elements, we, we try to then uh, identify a partner that's able in some one way or another address the issues. And, and, and interest rate really became, is a key issue here because it, it, as I said earlier, the rates are high. And if you see what really constitutes an interest rate is two key elements amongst the others. It's really, as a financial institution, institution, where do you source your capital from? If it's expensive capital, you pass on this cost to the MSMEs. If it's not expensive, likewise, the MSMEs will benefit. And you find a lot of these MSMEs are really closer to the um, circles, the fintechs, the MFIs, who really do not have much access to uh, cheap capital. They mm -hmm. tend to borrow from the banks, so they become the bank's customers, so they load on this expense really um, it, it layers on and is passed on to the MSME. So it becomes very expensive. The other element is around risk, whether perceived or real. If a sector is perceived to be risky or it has real risks, then of course this increases the costs of lending to this sector. And the creative sector is really perceived to be risky from a lot of angles and especially back to the IP element and how it's structured as, as, as a business. You know, the value chain is very fragmented. A lot of the, the players or entrepreneurs in this sector are informal. They are small, they are unstructured, they're not consolidated. So it's really, it's real and also the perceived risk really amplifying the cost of lending to these um, MSMEs. So for the foundation, we do not shy away from um, being an active player in uh, catalyzing really how we can um, um, include them in the financial inclusion ecosystem. So as I mentioned, we have these interventions that we um, that are deployed through our partners. But besides the interventions, our avenue is not just to pilot interventions, but as we pilot them is to tackle the systemic issues. What are the underlying issues? Um, and this was alluded to earlier, the perceptions, the mindsets, the practices really, the need to change, to have longevity and sustainability in some of these um, interventions that we're involved in, because an intervention in and of itself will come to an end and what outlives it. So it becomes sort of a two-pronged approach where, yes, we are piloting interventions, but the whole idea is really then to, to activate sustainable ecosystem issues that will outlive the intervention. And some of these have been spoken to, uh, about, in, e.g. engagement with policy um, makers like the central banks, you know, how, how do we engage with them to be able to reduce interest rates or in um, uh, address issues of collateral, uh, address issues of protecting IP, uh, raising awareness of IP, you know, elements like that. So, so we do get a bit deeper, more than the, the you know, the, the surface issues around interventions, but going a bit deeper around um, understanding the 
barriers and the root causes of these barriers, which tend to be very systemic and seeing how we can address them through our um, partners. So a lot going on in the foundation and um, really, as I said earlier, very, a very inclusive approach. Uh, our models tend to be very impactful from that sense and ensuring this longevity and 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 uh, this 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 the stay long before uh, after we've uh, exited exited with our uh, interventions yeah. i want to talk about some of those evolving consumer attitudes and behaviors in just a section a sec uh, in in just a moment but before we do that you know previously much of the fashion and retail industry's focus into the african continent was was primarily around regional strategies, you know, West Africa, Southern Africa, East Africa, or or individual country investment strategies for the biggest economies, Nigeria, South Africa, et cetera. But, you know, something that we've seen recently is some of that last mile delivery com complexity. And for those that are watching that, that don't know about the term last mile, but, you know, typically the final bit of delivering a parcel is the most expensive and the most challenging. And that is what, you know, all of your logistics and distribution networks have to consider. And it has been traditionally extremely challenging across a diverse 55 different countries, you know, with all of the complexity that creates. So, what has driven you know this this evolution in last mile logistics in in Africa and you know how significant is the uh, is that evolution and Sam I'll, I'll come to you first yes so um there has been significant improvements but it depends where you're looking so primarily in urban areas there has increasingly been a trend towards the use of um, more apps that require delivery. And these are for local consumption. So in many major African cities, you can buy your groceries online. Um, you can order a ride share. Uh, you, can, um, you can shop from um, a, a number of brands, whether the fashion or other, other products. Uh, and as a result, there has been significant investment in the last um, three years or so, and especially since COVID, in addressing this issue of last mile um, logistics in, in urban centers. Uh, so we've seen consumers demanding services, uh, consumers using apps, um, and these apps require deliveries. And so entrepreneurs, have built the last mile infrastructure and they are um and they're making these deliveries so you know in in much of africa we had um the culture of the motorbike taxi and that motorbike taxi has now evolved um and uh and it's being used for all number of small deliveries and then you have bigger deliveries and bigger vans uh bigger logistics companies investing uh to also to take up the um um the, the last mile uh, uh opportunity so we've seen uh we've seen a significant growth in uh in this area but primarily in in urban areas in big cities in the major economies Aparupa, thinking about infrastructure from a slightly different angle now, but similar to the impact of ride sharing apps and delivery apps, um, we were in preparation for this conversation, we were discussing marketplaces and some of the challenges or opportunities that those kind of digital services represent. Perhaps you could just share your, your insights on, on what perhaps could evolve for the better. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, I, I think to uh, to Sam's point, COVID really lit a fire under a lot of these things, you know. And I mean, even anecdotally, I have seen within a place like Nairobi and even more broadly, just Kenya at large, I've seen now the enormous uptick in in things like you know online deliveries and online payments and just kind of like getting boda boda guys to like send you things like within the course of a day or a couple of hours and what have you. So I think the pandemic coupled with an increasingly like young digitally co connected population has really kind of driven some of these trends um and in terms of in terms of um in terms of the continent we're expected to reach reach or maybe surpass half a billion e-commerce users 
um, by 2025 and also projected to continue with like fairly strong growth um, even through 2026. And this is despite sort of like not great macroeconomic conditions and what's happening in the world at large. Even despite that, this growth is expected to sort of continue and probably surpass other regions of the world. So from that piece of it, e-commerce, I think, is very much here to stay and it's growing. Um, to your point about to, to your point about um, marketplaces, one of the things that also came up in our research, which is quite interesting, um, and this is not sort of looking at some of these like social media platforms where you can now do commerce, right? So WhatsApp, Instagram, that that is ubiquitous. It's sort of low hanging fruit. But where where the where sort of our point of departure with those is that because we're looking at this from a perspective of scale and growth. While it is suited for, for, for in terms of an entry point to small and medium enterprises and micro enterprises, it's not conducive to getting those guys to the next level in terms of growth, right? So if we're looking at sort of other types of e-commerce marketplaces where bigger businesses or businesses that are looking to grow can sort of transact and um, and sell, one of the things that we discovered through our survey was that a lot of what's available right now are not necessarily tailored to the needs of African MSMEs. So survey mm -hmm. respondents talked about the fact that maybe some of these things were um, so maybe a little prohibitive in terms of price points and what they had to pay to access these platforms. Um, some of them found the platforms to be not very intuitive. Going back to what Sam had mentioned about digital skills and training, um, some of these uh, some of these um, platforms require more specialized digital skills and capabilities that these young entrepreneurs just may not have and would need that capacity building for help to, in order to help them sort of access that. So. I think these are some of the some of the things that we're seeing. Of course, in terms of, I mean, if you're talking about sort of like digital digital logistics and digital services, we can't ignore the fintech. Um, everyone knows Nigeria is like Africa's fintech darling. Um, Kenya is a regional hub in East Africa, South Africa for Southern Africa, and Egypt for North, Northern Africa. These are kind of the usual suspects, and there's a ton of really interesting progress and things happening there. Um, but I think there's also other parts of the continent where there's real growth and movement here, right? So just next door in Somalia, mobile payments right now account for, I think, something like more than 80% of all their transactions, which is enormous. Um, a couple of years ago, before sort of like some of these um, economic crises hit, Ghana was the fastest growing mobile money market in the world. So I think there's a lot of really interesting happening things happening in the continent. And I think it would behoove us to also pay attention to, you know, countries outside of the usual suspects, because I think that's where there's a really interesting activity happening, really interesting innovations happening and growth happening in un unexpected ways and places. Sam, we've just, had Ap just heard Aparupa mention a, a couple of countries that were perhaps outside of the usual suspects, as it were. But are there any areas of high growth or where you see this evolution taking place at an accelerated rate that you think may be interesting to our viewers to be aware of, or but also potentially interesting to our viewers from the international fashion industry thinking about more diverse and broader investment plans? You know, Are there any new hotspots that you think you'd like to point out? So, um, you know, with my background in, uh, in, in large corporate, we always look for scale. So for uh, international investors looking to come into Africa, I still think that uh, the less sexy traditional locations are still where you're going to get the most um, returns. Uh, so, you know, you're looking at South Africa, you're looking at Kenya, you're looking at Nigeria, um, Egypt, um, and perhaps and perhaps Ghana uh, in the in the top five. Um, these are strong. These are countries with strong um, logistics and distribution networks, uh, as especially in their major, especially in their major cities. But I wouldn't stop there uh, because you know the next five after that, you would look at countries like you know, some of the Francophone countries like Ivory Coast. Um, and, and and Senegal um, and even even here in Southern Africa uh, in countries like like Botswana uh, and 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 you know Botswana has got uh, as one of the richest countries on the African continent on a per capita basis uh, and also a young population that's embracing technology. So yes, I would go for the traditional uh, markets uh, because that's that's where the that's where the volume is. 
um, but there are there are a few there are a few nuggets um, around. But but my my bias would be towards the the big markets where where the volumes are. And on the subject of younger consumers, in the report, it states that sixty percent of the continent's population is under twenty five. It is the youngest and second largest population in the world. Um, and that, as you've said, uh, um, Aparupa, that Africa is forecast to surpass half a billion e-commerce users by 2025. Um, 46% of the population in sub-Saharan Africa, or 495 million individuals, had mobile service subscriptions by the end of 2020. And that is an increase of approximately 20 million in 2019. So, you know, the, the impact of smartphones, technology, younger consumers is clearly the headline you know driving change here but to dig down further into that um Aparupa, i want to come to you first and just talk to you a little bit about social media and how this is not only creating opportunities for social commerce but also engaging customers in new kinds of behavior you know social media is you know such a tool to drive consumption for good or for ill so what are your top line insights on that shifts in con- those shifts in consumer behavior so I think I think we have to be careful to not paint paint like different countries with the same brush because even if we sort of like take a common point of departure, so let's assume for argument's sake, these five countries have the exact same digital penetration, they have the exact same mobile subscription, everyone has access to a mobile phone. What they do with that phone is going to be likely very different from country to country. So I think I think sometimes we tend to conflate access with adoption and use. Um, and, uh, and I think this is where what I was speaking to a little bit uh, uh, before about socioculture factors, I think that sort of comes into fl- play, right? So in addition to sort of the big picture and maybe the harder stuff around like access and connectivity and what have you, what, what are the ways in which like different countries and their sociocultural environment um, and, and their practices around that. How, do that, how does that sort of influence um, consumer behavior and engagement? And I think a really interesting example is, um, is actually from India. And when Amazon first went to India, so when Amazon first went to India many years ago, after obviously experiencing enormous success in the U.S., they essentially had to completely rethink their entire business model when coming into, the, coming into India. India at the time, I mean, much more so than now, was very, very rural had very little internet uh, uh, connectivity and penetration and was a cash-based economy, right, by and large. And on top of that, what was really interesting was Indians were very accustomed, and this is both in urban and rural areas, to buy, sell, transact from small neighborhood-based mom-and-pop type retailers. So when Amazon came into India, they realized that they had to kind of integrate these mom and pop retailers at the core of their business model because consumers were not going to go anywhere and insofar as obviously like like the, there were these like big economic considerations right rural cash base etc cetera, etc cetera. this thing about the fact that i'm going to go to my neighborhood guy because i've been going him to, to him for like for like 20 years and that's where i buy my stuff that speaks to a certain sort of socio cultural um practice and habit that cannot be ignored. And I mean, anecdotally, I am from Calcutta. I was in Calcutta a few weeks ago visiting my family and we have big malls, we have all these fancy places. My dad is like on Amazon and Flipkart and all these e-commerce websites. But when push comes to shove, when we want to do like our, like, you know, our shopping and stuff, we still go to the same, same neighborhood stores we've been going to, like, I mean, since I was born and probably from beforehand. So I think, so based on that, you have the, you have the tools, you have the marketplaces, you have the access, but I think drilling into sort of how people think about buying, shopping, selling, what are they comfortable with, these things around trust, I think those are the things that those soft considerations are what we should be careful to not ignore as we're thinking about some of these other factors. Sam, before I come to you and talk more directly to the role of social media in driving e-commerce, 
Mercy, I just wanted to to turn to you and actually just, you know, you meant you reacted earlier when we were talking about the need to build trust, the need for perhaps stronger brands to really pioneer trust in in different markets so people can associate that brand with a certain level of security. You know, how is your how is the foundation trying to engage with these socio-cultural factors and to help the development of a of a more trusting e-commerce environment? Well, the foundation is um, a catalyst and responds to uh, problems, challenges, barriers, but most important, as I said earlier, really underline the root causes of these issues. And Aparupa mentioned a lot of it is really under the, uh, associated with the social cultural um, issues. So, so what we do is truly really try to understand the issue and the pathway really to the impact that we'd like to see around the issue. And especially for us, we're very concerned about inclusivity and the marginalized communities, especially those in the rural areas, gender and youth in particular, which really is our North Star here as a foundation. So whatever we do, you know, in terms of building the African brand or, or you know, or resolving a solution, we contextualize it around certain key parameters that are very pertinent to foundation, youth being one of them, the young woman and gender in uh, particular, uh, inclusivity for the uh, disab disabled and refugees, the rural uh, folks that are very marginalized, especially when you talk about the digital divide and the access to information and the infrastructure. So the foundation's role is to be catalytic around these elements. And this is what we build really our programming around and partnerships. Thank you very much. Um, Sam, I, I know that the survey really was emphatic in identifying how significant social media is as a conduit to to growth and sales opportunities. Could you give our audience some of those some of those insights about quite how significant it can be? Yeah, so I would say about ten years ago, social media was very much in its infancy um, in on the African continent, even though in some other international markets in Europe and um, the Americas, it was uh, a bit more established. Uh, and I would say, you know, seven to eight years ago, um, the bulk of creative merchants would probably get their, uh, their new customer inquiries from word of mouth, from people in their network. Uh, and what the report shows us is that in the last few years, social media has eaten significantly into the word of mouth market share, if you like, where they are now effectively equal. I mean, according to the data, I think it's 48.3% word of mouth of the designers uh, and the creative merchants that were surveyed um, and 47% uh, and um, was, uh, was social media. Um, and, and this is not entirely surprising, uh, just given the fact that um, the majority of Africans are now on, on social media in one form or the other. Um, according to the World Bank, 72% of, of Africans use social media mm. to look for and discover uh, new products and, and services. So it's, it's, a, it's a really significant, and I think we were surprised by just how um, quickly social media has become normal. Um, and, you know, every now and then there is, uh, there is, you know, whenever there's an outage for Facebook or Twitter uh, and, and there is an outcry uh, when that happens and it just shows you how critical um, these, these platforms have become to people's daily lives um, across the African continent. I'm conscious of time and we have a couple of questions that I think will be useful for us to answer. So I'm going to move on now to our last topic of discussion, which is around the African continental free trade area. Um, it was established in 2018 by the African continental free trade agreement. And after the World Trade Organization, it's the largest free trade area by number of member states and the largest pop in population and geographic size, spanning 1.3 billion people across the world's second largest continent. Um, but its its need is very much apparent um, from our conversations in preparing for this talk. 
um, it would appear from your your experience that Africans still trade more with the rest of the world than with each other in a general way. Obviously, there are going to be exceptions. It's far too big and far too diverse a continent to be able to make those kind of inter in generalizations. But intracontinental market inaccessibility has been a barrier for investment. And I want to dig down now into, you know, what should be prioritized to support the development and growth, not only of the SME brands that we're talking about, but of the creative industries at a top level. And Aparupa, I'll start with you and then I'll go to Sam. So Robert, would you mind repeating the question uh, once again? It just cut out a little bit. What should be prioritized to support brands and the development of the creative industries? I mean, I know, you know, what is your take on how effective the outcomes of trade agreements have been to this point and, and where they should evolve to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the ASCFDA is incredibly ambitious and uh, uh, of course it's still a work in progress uh, because of the sheer magnitude of the agreement, right? And all the things that need to that need to sort of come into play for it to fully be uh, operationalized. Uh, for the purposes of this conversation, I think I'll just touch on four, four, four areas around this. Um, uh, a couple sort of more general and a couple more specific to the creative industry and, and also particularly fashion, since uh, that's uh, that's a big part of what we're talking about today. One is that there still is there is still relatively low awareness about the AFCFTA and sort of the the details around how to engage with the AFCFTA, um, particularly amongst Africans private Africa's private sector. And this was called out during the AU Private Sector Forum last um, last week, and it's also something that has come up um, um, in the in the Path Track annual Africa CEO Trade Survey that's been happening for the past couple of years. So that's 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 kind of a big thing. Um, there's a general sort of excitement. And there's general optimism about, about the AFCFTA and the potential that it has for African private sector and intra, intercontinental trade. But in terms of understanding how to actually engage with it, that's where there, there's considerable information asymmetry still. So that's a big part of what needs to be addressed in order to really sort of bring in the African private sector from SMEs all the way up to sort of larger uh, conglomerates and multinationals. Um, the second issue that I'd like to touch on is around rules of origin. I am no trade expert, so I'm not going to go into the details of it. Um, but essentially for some industries, and I think it's notably something like textiles and, and automotives, if I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, um, where in a lot of cases across Africa, there's much higher imports than domestic production and exports. Um, it's been difficult to kind of harmonize rules of origin for, for these industries. And, and as a result of that, th that's kind of slowed down the ability to in, sort of include these industries in the, in the broader continental free trade agreement. So that's another thing that's kind of been like slowing down the progress in terms of uh, including things like textiles and apparel, fashion, and the broader creative uh, industry into, into the framework. Um, also somewhat related, a lot of the instruments um, that the that the AFCFT has launched are not yet fully operationalized, right? So something like um, the Pan-African Payment and Settlement System, for example, which was launched in um, early 2022, if I'm not mistaken, it's still, I mean, it still doesn't have that much uh, in terms of sort of activity. I think as far as uh, as far as I know, only eight central banks and maybe 28 commercial banks have sort of been actively, become actively involved in the PAPS network. Um, but obviously, I mean, compared to the continent at large, a lot more of these banks need to get involved in order for this to kind of like be rolled out at scale. Um, and then finally, and I think this is an important recent development, which was that um, the African the African ministers agreed, uh, a cohort of African ministers uh, agreed to um, basically ban um, second the trading of secondhand clothing under the AFCFTA. And that's incredibly important because a lot of national and regional value chains within Africa have been severely negatively impacted by the import of very cheap secondhand clothes. And yeah. this is true everywhere, right? I mean, Kenya is a great example where Mutumba is, uh, it makes it very difficult to be competitive in producing new clothing with mm -hmm. like sort of for domestic consumption because of these things. So I think that was a big a big and very significant um, development that has happened recently that's specific to the fashion industry. Samuel, thinking about brands specifically and potentially some of the skills issues we've heard about or, or anything else, what, what do you think should be prioritized in terms of regulations or support for brands specifically? Uh, so just just to, uh, before I answer that question, Robin, uh, just to a purpose point, uh, the survey, also reinforce this message about the need for 
a single market uh, like what the AFCTA is trying to, to achieve. Um, less than 4% of the designer surveys are selling to other African countries. Um, and yet about 15% are selling internationally. Um, and then the other 80%, 80 or odd percent comes from their local market. So uh, the reduction of barriers within trade barriers within Africa itself will, our data suggests, will have a really significant impact on, um, on designers being able to fulfill uh, demand from, from, from neighboring countries. And we know anecdotally that you might be in Kenya and want something from Nigeria because you know they do the best tie and die. Um, or you might be in South Africa and want you know sandals from Kenya because they make the best sandals, or you want um a bubu or a kaftan from Senegal. Um, and Africans really want to buy from each other. And so far that has been that has been very difficult with the existing set of trade rules. So uh, we're going I think we're gonna see a significant impact. Um, in, on the fashion and creative sectors when the uh, AFCTA becomes fully operational. Then in terms of um, how, how else do we support brands, I keep coming back to, so I would say there are two things that, that, that need to be done. Um, I think the first would be um, policy. Uh, there's some easy policy wins that can be addressed uh, to make it easier for brands to do business, especially uh, cross-border. Um, there are also uh, issues around um, standardization frameworks. Uh, anybody who's traded, say, fashion products in, in Europe knows that, you know, the sizing that you would use in Italy and, uh, you know, the sizing that you would use in, in the U.S. Um, may not necessarily be the same. And in Africa, we're going to have to start thinking because, you know, um, although we all look similar, we actually have different body shapes, body, body types as you move across the continent. So these kinds of standardization frameworks will make it much, much easier for us to, mm. to trade with each other. And then, of course, um, the big thing is, uh, is, is training. Um, and, and that kind of goes hand in hand with, with standardization so that um, our merchants, are, our designers are competitive. Um, they are able to, uh, uh, you know, sell to customers because their uh, the, the products of the are of an international standard. They're they're using um, the right sizing and grading frameworks, uh, and 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 so they can they they can trade trade internationally. So this is what I'd say are some of the key support areas. I'd also like to touch. A bit on gender, I think that uh, that's an important point that we probably haven't done much uh, justice to uh, in this in this discussion. But um, sitting here in my in my male privilege, I was actually quite surprised by how stark um, the data was uh, in terms of how far behind um, female fashion creatives are compared to their male counterparts. Uh, so what the data is telling us is that the majority of fashion creatives are women, but the data is also telling us that the men are making more money than, 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 than the women, um, that the men are using digital payments more than women. Men are using e-commerce and e-commerce platforms more than women. And so I think this is a very, very important issue that, that needs to be addressed because you know, women are in the majority. And, um, and making it easier for them to participate and trade and to be trained will result in significant economic benefits, obviously not just for them, but for their families, and um, also have you know, positive macroeconomic effects when people are trading and making more money. Absolutely. Mercy, thinking about scale at this point, what do you think is very important for the agreement to achieve that will really help businesses grow to scale? Um, maybe two elements. The first one is really the trust within the different countries. Um, you know, harmonizing uh, the regulations and opening up the free trade area across the continent to really create this huge, you know, trade in area in Africa is going to be based on trust because there's a lot of gives and takes, you know, 
especially when we talk about tariffs. A lot of countries tend to lose um, tariffs, you know, through these uh, trade agreements. So how do they compensate for that? How do they possibly start widening the um, uh, task, tax revenues, really, especially from these informal traders in the creative sector? But on the other hand, without being too punitive on them, but also giving them incentives. So that's another way of scaling, really. But also the intellectual property for me is a big one, where I, um, there's need to protect it and commercialize it beyond what's being done right now and really recognizing its value both by the MSMEs themselves and the financial institutions. Thank you very much. Um, just before we turn to our final question, I'm going to ask two of the questions from the audience. Um, one is, are there African e-commerce platforms that you've come across that address any of these barriers in terms of skills and language? And has your research considered WhatsApp business and more low-tech platforms to cultivate more trade and transactions, which I know, I know it has. But are there any e-commerce platforms that you think are better aligned to the entrepreneurial culture and needs of African entrepreneurs? So I think, oh, was that to me? Um, to anyone. Yeah, let's start with you, Sam. Yeah, I mean, so I think there are a number of e-commerce platforms on the continent, but unfortunately, none of them is quite providing the full range of support services that are required. You know, I, I like to call it foundational. Um, you know, anybody can give you a platform where you can sell. But, you know, addressing some of those foundational challenges so that merchants can trade and scale e effectively is still very much a, a, a work in progress. Any other comments on that? No. Nope. What was the second part of the question? What was the second part of that question? <laughs> second part was about WhatsApp, but we've already covered it in the conversation. Okay. Um, second question I want to ask is, where can the audience find the report? Uh, Anansi.com slash white paper 2023. Perfect. And we will be writing this conversation up and we'll ensure there's a download link in that article if, it, if you are a regular visitor to BOF. OK, um, now, given that we are just at time, I want to ask one more question um, and I'll start with you, Mercy, and then I'll go to Aparupa and then we can finish with Sam. You, you know, uh, we're talking about the development of growing one, a 1% 1 slice of the, of the creative industry pie to a much bigger slice that reflects demographic size and potential. What, how would you advise policymakers, decision makers to ensure that any future value generation it created by the development of Africa's many different fashion industries stays within or benefits the continent to an appropriate amount and isn't extracted as so many previous industries have experienced? Mm -hmm. Uh, possibly from an access to finance perspective, and this has been mirrored by a project uh, that we're doing around uh, fund of funds, is um, with any investment that's coming into the continent, external investment is really how do you ensure it's domiciled within the continent so that any capital circulates within the continent and any wealth that's created is retained within the continent. I think that's very uh, important. What we're seeing right now, domiciliation is primarily outside the continent. So it's a very extractive model. So how do you reverse that? And of course, there are reasons why it's happening the way it's happening. So um, even as a continent, how do we make ourselves more attractive at a domiciliation for investment vehicles? I think that's going to be very critical. Thank you, Mercy. Aparupa? I, I, it's a big question, but I'll, I'll try to sort of like zero in. So I think I think it's a couple of things. I think one I think one big thing is like I think as a as a continent we kind of need to rethink a little bit what we what we think about as export markets. Um, I mean I can't speak obviously to like uh, the the entire continent, but I do know in East Africa places like Kenya, Kenya, Uganda, etc. Um, there is a push towards more export oriented industries when it comes to things like textiles and apparel, right? And there's a high degree of dependence. I mean I mean I haven't checked these numbers in in, in a while now, so don't quote me on this, but but at the time when I was checking for Kenya, I seen something like 93% of Kenya's textile and apparel industry is dependent on a Goa, which means exports to the US market. And I think now with AFCFTA, we're talking about rules of origin, et cetera. I think we need to rethink like what we, what we understand export markets to mean. An export market could also be uh, sort of landlocked countries within Africa that are now sort of getting resell, resold secondhand clothing that could benefit from, you know, locally produced, um, uh, 
uh, outfits that are coming in from not Europe, not China, not uh, not uh, the USA, but from Kenya or Uganda or Tanzania or Rwanda. So I think we need to kind of rethink like what we mean by exports, imports, where where sort of our partnerships are coming from, and how we're sort of rejigging some of these value chains within the continent. Um, and that's a policy play in as much as it's an infrastructural logistics, et cetera, play. Thank you very much. Samuel, what are your final thoughts? So um, as, a, as a fashion entrepreneur myself and um, you know, CEO of a digital platform that works with African fashion designers, such a privilege to see just the amount of talent that there is on the continent, um, the beautiful product that young African minds are creating. Uh, and I think that uh, the, the best service that they can, that can be done for them is making sure that um, their products find a home and their products find, find markets. So my advice to policymakers would be to look and be creative about how we get these thousands, potentially even millions of young people who are creatives and who are making really amazing products to find markets. You know, we're not trying to create the next Zara or the next H&M. It's a different model. And we need to think creatively about how we get these, you know, beautiful, special, um, small runs to customers all over the world and find them a market because, you know, some of the products are really quite amazing. Which is far more aligned with some of the seismic changes we're seeing globally about identity and concern and narrative and storytelling around products. Thank you Absolutely. all so much for your wisdom and insight and expertise. Um, I've learned an incredible amount and enjoyed talking to you all very much. Thank you to all of you for joining us from home. Um, as I say, we will be writing this conversation up. It is available on YouTube and we look forward to seeing you in the next BOF Live. But Aparupa, Mercy, Samuel, thank you very, very much. Have a wonderful evening and I will speak to you soon. Thank you 